Hey, welcome to the show. Today we're going to talk about a paper that the IMF released at the beginning of March that talks about changes to cross-border payments and mentions both Ripple and Stellar. So let's break down what was in the paper and what we learned from it. Hey, welcome to the show. Molly here. Today, we're going to talk about a paper that the IMF released a couple of days ago in early March that talked about cross-border payments. It was a 38-page paper. It's actually a fairly easy read compared to some of these banking papers that are like almost tortuous to go through. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take out a couple of excerpts. Like I'm going to read you verbatim what was in the paper and then share my interpretation about what I think that what it means. And the cool thing about this paper, I'll actually put the link in the description if you want to check out the whole thing, is it really does sort of teach you about the problem with cross-border payments, why the situation is not really sustainable, and then what tokenized assets in the blockchain are going to offer. So it surprises me to say this, but I'm commending the IMF for a wonderful paper that I learned a lot from. Um, which I don't normally have a lot of very positive things to say about many of these global banking institutions, but this one was actually pretty good. So, all right. They clearly define the objective of the paper is to consider a global clearinghouse that eliminates the need for a complete set of bilateral trust relationships and ends by advancing a model for a make marketplace to trade tokenized money directly across borders. So what they're saying here is that the current system of moving money requires like party A and party B to have a trust relationship with each other. In the same way, if you went to your local farmer's market and you were going to buy something from a farmer, there has to be trust on both sides of that deal that you know, I'm going to get what I'm buying and that the person selling believes they're going to get money that has value. So there is this, what they're going to call bilateral trust relationship. And when it comes to moving money around the globe, like that's easier said than done. Tokenized money actually will enable there to be a global marketplace. And if you watch my video a while where we talked about this sort of casino marketplace analogy, that's kind of this idea where everyone in the world goes to this one place and it's a it's an online place. You don't have to physically go there. And a value can be exchanged for other value going through a central bridge. Um, this is sort of the ODL XRP model. And if you kind of imagine a, a wheel where you have all these sort of entities around the edge of the wheel and they all have spokes that go into the center where you would do the trading, that's sort of the idea of a liquidity pool where you have one currency that is dominant. And that's really, I'm kind of just summarizing what the big picture theme is of this paper. That's what they are suggesting, some kind of global marketplace that would enable value to be exchanged via tokenized assets. But all right, let's go down through some of the other details here. Okay, the current system of money relies on trust, which is not easy to establish and maintain. That is my interpretation. Their quote is, in the realm of credit-based money, trust plays a key role. Trust, however, is expensive to establish. And they talk about the correspondent banking system and how many banks have to have branches in countries around the world to set up and establish this trust. And that is expensive because, you know, you got to have money that goes in those accounts. You have to often have staff and employees that are managing that stuff. So to have a global banking infrastructure is a, is a big deal. Now, the next part we're going to talk about is how there are networks in money and banking that exist to support trust in these transactions. And their quote specifically is credit based payment transactions can occur only among people in the same trust network. So. Another thing that's kind of key to understand here that surprised me immensely until I learned about this sort of a year or two ago is that when banks send money to other banks, like no one actually ever sends money. Like that's sort of the crazy part. It's all this sort of accounting game where money just gets deducted from one account and credited to another. And that in order for that to work, we have to trust that both parties, you know, in this arrangement are going to do what they say. And this is sometimes referred to as counterparty trust in sort of larger deals, but that absolutely is key in the banking system. Now, there are some technical challenges as well to moving money, even though it's like not literally being moved, but this value being exchanged um, in that there are 
technical challenges, and their quote specifically is that payment transactions can only occur over common infrastructure. So let's say that you are in a country and there are a bunch of banks in that country and these banks all have a relationship with the central bank and you all sort of know each other and trust each other. That's considered a network. Now, if you have another country that's like across the border, right? And they have their own network. Like there isn't really a logistical way for money to be sent like across the border. Remember, the money never moves. It's just this accounting system. It's almost like there are two train tracks and these trains go around and around and there's all these different stops at the, you know, on a train network, a train track set, whatever. And you can get on and off at the station. So these stations are kind of like banks and you can move money from you know one station to the other one. Well, imagine then you have a totally separate train track network, like that doesn't overlap the other one. How do you get a train from track set A to track set B when they are separate. That's kind of this interoperability problem where you can't really move money from one network to another one in the current banking system unless you then, you know, it kind of would mean that every train track thing would need to set up a station like in every network. And that's where we get into this logistical expense problem that I just mentioned before. And that's really what correspondent banking things are about. Okay. Next, the problem of interoperability in payments is thus defined as the transfer of value across trust networks. So that's this idea with these train tracks that they can't jump the track. They can't go from one to the other. And this is where the blockchain really comes in and this idea of interoperability where blockchains can be connected and value can be transferred from one to the other. Sometimes this is done with like uh, maybe some temporary measures like a wrapped token where you create a mirror, mirror image almost of something to operate on other. But then there are some um, blockchains that are going to be truly interoperable and you can send value from one blockchain to another and it's the original asset itself, not a mirror image or a wrapped version. Okay, so within countries, the central bank can act as this central entity for payments between banks. Oops, imagine, I lost my little note there. Imagine a, a wheel where every spoke on the tire is connected to the bank at the center. And their quote is that the central bank works as a powerful trust enhancing mechanism. So I, I mentioned that in the beginning, but it's a really powerful visual to see how, like in the United States, for example, the Federal Reserve System acts as this central entity and all the banks in the world can send money there or sort of move money through the Fed because the Fed has relationships with all the banks. They act as this, um, almost like the, the train conductor maybe in this analogy who collects the tickets and gives them out and they sort of are the decision maker. That do, that's works great in a country. There is this problem though when you want to move money from one country to another, which we call cross-border payments. And this is where the correspondent banking system has come in. And their quote in the paper is that banks must build their own bilateral trust links, often at significant expense. And the expense, for the most part, from my understanding, is that they have to put a bunch of money in each of these accounts around the world to enable these crediting and debiting system when payments are made. And that adds up like trillions and trillions of dollars globally. All right, so now we bring in this idea of tokenizing. So their quote, tokenizing money means inscribing and trading property rights to a currency on a common ledger. So this is an interesting uh, nuance about tokenization. And when I first sort of heard about tokenization and, and learned about it, I had this idea, it was like a poker chip and that I have my chunk of gold or whatever, and I'm going to create a poker chip on the blockchain that represents that asset. That's partly it, but what it really more is, is a set of property rights associated with owning that asset. I just wrote a blog post on that for Val Hill Advisors. I'm going to put that in the comments. But when you tokenize something, what you are literally tokenizing are all the different property rights associated with that asset. So if I have a chunk of gold, what that means is I have the right to put that gold in my safe. I have the right to sell that gold. I have the right to lend that gold. I have the right to melt it down and make jewelry with it. I have the right to bury it. Like there's a whole lot of rights that I have that are associated with owning an asset. And that's literally what gets tokenized on the blockchain are the property rights. Okay, next one. All right, so when money is tokenized, this is a quote then, the trust required for transactions and settlement changes drastically while that related to the value of money and compliance does not. So what their point is, is that when we're exchanging value via tokenized assets, you don't have to have the same level of trust between two parties because the asset is being owned on the blockchain and 
it's being moved through usually a digital wallet. And that's where they bring in this idea. They're referring to wallet providers as gateways. Gateways are likely to play an essential role in tomorrow's world of digital money. Sorry, I keep scrolling and losing my spot. All right, that is when they bring in this, introduce this idea of wallet providers as gateways. Gateways are likely to play an essential role in tomorrow's world of digital money. Gateways can be digital wallet providers that stand in between us, the issue of the money, and users. So if you've ever used a crypto or digital wallet, this will seem very familiar to you, but the idea is that this wallet is almost, I'm going to call it like the broker, even though I know that has a very specific technical term in finance. They're sort of acting as the conduit, the the central party that you are moving the funds through. Uh, and that is, they're arguing, is essential part of this new digital monetary infrastructure and will help remove the need for trust that was part of the sort of legacy old school world. The gateway, their quote is, the gateway fulfills the important task of mutualizing trust. And what that means, in my interpretation, is that we both trust the wallet, so we don't have to trust each other. All right, next part. One possible model to enhance cross-border payments is to establish a marketplace on a digital platform to trade tokenized money across borders. So that goes back to my casino marketplace uh, idea that I talked about in a previous video, and that this global digital marketplace is the solution where currently there are all these sort of separate networks in each country. Let's just have one where everybody can trade with each other. But if let's say you had just 10 currencies in the world, just to keep argument this simple, if I went to this global marketplace and we had 10 different currencies, you might need to have 10, what they call liquidity pools, where there's a comp, actually it'd be more than that. You need to have a combination of A and B, A and C, A and D, A and E, B and B, B and C. And you can see all the combinations of all the different, it's like a factorial thing. So you would need a lot of uh, combinations if you had each trading pair set up as a unique thing. So the solution to that is to have one common currency. This is where if you study XRP at all, you know, that's sort of the idea is that everybody first trades their thing to XRP and they trade XRP to the thing that they want. Drastically reduces the number of liquidity pairs that you would need. And in highly functional markets, high liquidity is great, meaning liquidity means it's easy to buy and sell whatever it is that you want to buy and sell. So their quote here is that a third currency, which are calling C currency, because they were, have, were referring to A and B in the original example, could become a vehicle currency on the marketplace. So that's this idea of a bridge, neutral bridge currency, which could be XRP, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. I mean, XLM could function that capacity in the global supply chain, XDC as well. And I, you know, people do argue that Bitcoin could serve that function as well. So I don't think it necessarily means only one could serve that purpose, but you'd want one that was highly liquid, was easy to trade, transaction speeds want to be fast and inexpensive, which is why I think XRP is often considered ideal for that. All right. Strong markets have high liquidity, which means fewer trading pairs that are widely used. Their quote in the paper was, the currency pairs traded on the marketplace will naturally gravitate to those offering the most liquidity. This is a key concept. And we sort of see that money likes efficiency and that over time, if you had a lot of options, people will just naturally gravitate towards the one with the most stuff. I mean, this is the Amazon model, right? Many, many years ago, there was tons and tons of places where you could buy stuff. And those places still exist. But if you think about like the volume of people buying stuff online being a measure of liquidity, Amazon over time has just become the, the de facto, like where most people buy. Does that mean it's the only place people buy things? No. But we saw over time the market move towards efficiency. It's just easier to Use Amazon then to have 10 different places you buy all your stuff. All right, who should build this marketplace? And the quote in the paper is, an important question is who builds and operates such a marketplace and which rules will govern it? So they have three models that they suggest. One is a private asset and marketplace, such as Rick, Ripple's XRP. This, and that is, I think they're referring to the ODL market that is managed by Ripple. The second thing is an open source marketplace, such as the Stellar Foundation or DeFi networks. Those are great. There are some concerns, I would imagine, with some people in the banking system that want sort of KYC type things, or if there were certain parts of the marketplace that were to be for institutional investors only, that would probably not be as easy to do on an open DeFi exchange unless you had some sort of NFT that required you 
you need an NFT to get in. Then the third one they have is a marketplace and settlement asset based on unbacked crypto assets such as Strike, which leverages Bitcoin in the Lightning Network. So they're not simply pointing to only one, but they're mentioning these three possibilities, which are all sort of things that I've heard about as having potential. And that is kind of the, the key takeaways that they mention XRP, they mention Stellar, and they do mention Bitcoin as well as possible ways for all of this global trade to work. Um, you know, the world is such a big place. I don't necessarily think only one option wins. And I certainly think that in the beginning, we'll have multiple ones. You know, some of the uh, valuation models that I've worked on make the assumption of XRP being representing all the value in the world. And that's sort of a very extreme case scenario that could happen, but it would probably take a very, very long time for that efficiency to kick in. Same way it took a while for Amazon to become the sort of de facto. And it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm certainly not under the illusion that all things are bought and sold online on Amazon, but they have the lion's share. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see as we kind of move toward this new financial system, whether or not the IMF sort of plan that they've laid out uh, plays plays out. Now, when I wrote a Twitter thread about this, I kind of alluded to the IMF saying that Stellar or XRP could become this global marketplace for cross-border payments. I actually think that it is an and that I think XRP will be used by certain sectors, specifically the institutional wholesale sector. Primary, and then Stellar will have a place for retail and business to people types of payments. Um, that's just my prediction. I think there's room for both. I kind of see Stellar and XRP as the king and the queen. They're very related. Uh, and I'm excited to see what happens. So that's my summary of the IMF paper. I'll put some links in the descriptions if you want to read it yourself and watch the video that I mentioned about the global marketplace because it does explain a little bit about kind of how I envisioned this playing out. All right. If you enjoyed this video, please like it. Appreciate it. Subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.